welcome to the week four supplemental lecture on Mary Midgley's How Myths Work. This is one of our shortest readings, if not the shortest reading this week. It's only about six pages long. Midgley is a very clear writer, and I suspect that with the background that you have from the previous three weeks of the course, you can probably read this one without a supplemental podcast to help. Uh, the reason to listen to the podcast would be if you just want to hear a little bit more about how Midgley's ideas connect to other things that people are writing about that we may take a look at later in the course or that you might want to in a subsequent paper. So Mitchell is one of a number of people who start working on the issue of myth and metaphor, not as bits of irrationality that are sort of extraneous to logical thought, but as part of the essence of thought itself. A lot of the people who work in this area are actually cognitive scientists. Midgley is a moral philosopher, but she's occupying a somewhat similar space in criticizing notions of rationality that would oppose themselves to notions of myth. And she's saying that myths are interpretive frameworks. They do really important work. In fact, we can't do without them and that therefore it becomes meaningful or intelligible to start asking about the myths of science itself. So myth is not something from Midgley that is something primitive or something that earlier societies used to do that we've become enlightened out of. Myth is a more general term for her, for an interpretive framework, a storytelling framework that we use to make decisions about what's important, what's not important, what we need to attend to, and what things mean for how we should behave. So she says, we're accustomed to think of myths as the opposite of science, but in fact they are a central part of it, the part that decides its significance in our lives. Myths are not lies, nor are they detached stories. They're imaginative patterns, networks of powerful symbols that suggest particular ways of interpreting the world. They shape its meaning. And she brings up a couple of images here, and she'll bring up more as the piece goes on. She talks about the way that we find machine imagery intuitive. So we talk about genetic engineering. We talk about the building blocks of life. And she also talks about reductive atomistic imagery. And she particularly emphasizes here the microscope and the idea that somebody might treat what you see through the microscope as more real than whole phenomena that we can perceive with our everyday senses. She's worried about different forms of reductionism. And she thinks that metaphors around atomism, around machinery and the rest, suggest certain kinds of reductionism and therefore make it more likely to happen. She says, to an extent unknown in earlier times, our dominant technology shapes our symbolism and thereby our metaphysics, our view of what is real. Okay, so our myths are drawing a lot of inspiration from our technologies. Myths can draw from other sources, and we need to think about the way our thoughts are being shaped by our technologies and whether we want them to be shaped that way. And then she makes a play here on a Christian critique of non-Christian religions, the sorts of language you might find in the Bible. The heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. So this sounds like you're talking about something primitive. And then she inverts that expectation. Steel and glass, plastic and rubber and silicon are his own devising and sees them as the final truth. And she's not the only person who makes comments like this. Weber will, Marx will. The idea that there's something in contemporary materialism that is ironically acting out the kinds of things that Christianity seems to be criticizing when it's criticizing sort of other religions for erecting idols that are just made of wood and stone and worshiping the products of human hands rather than a true God. Uh, she's suggesting that modern materialism can have something of that in it as well. So she talks about the role of myths in cognition. She's particularly interested in this opening chapter in distinguishing the idea of myth as a fundamental building block of how we think from the sort of popular conception or even anthropological conception of myths that tends to be something exotic that other societies do. So she says when people become aware of this imagery, they tend to think of it as a mere surface dressing of isolated metaphors, a kind of optional decorative paint that is sometimes added to ideas after they're formed so as to make them clear to outsiders. But really, she says, such symbolism is an integral part of our thought structure. 
It does crucial work on all topics, not just in a few supposedly marginal areas such as religion and emotion, where symbols are known to be at home but throughout our thinking. And again, she's not alone in making this kind of argument. So these are not just frills, these metaphors, these myths, these images that we use. But when we're saying something like genetic engineering, it's actually doing cognitive work. It's linking up with other associations we have with engineering, with machines, with related concepts. And this is affecting how we're thinking about the science itself and what we think we can do with scientific information. She says, the way in which we imagine the world determines what we think is important in it, what we select for our attention among the welter of facts that constantly flood in upon us. Only after we've made that selection can we start to form our official, literal thoughts and descriptions. That's why we need to become aware of these symbols. So if we're not aware of them, they just do their associative thing. They structure the associations we're likely to have. They channel our thoughts in particular ways, they make certain options look more plausible to us than others, by becoming more aware of how they do this, we might actually increase the choices that we can make. And then she asks the question of sort of whether it's valid to think of science as neutral. So some of the other readings we've had this week have addressed the question of the neutrality of science in various ways. She says that science can be seen in conflicting ways. One is that of being value free. So it's objective, it's unbiased, it's neutral, it's a pure source of facts. Now, this is a slightly different representation of what the neutrality of science means from some of the people that we read in the other topic this week. So it can be interesting to go back and compare it to what, say, Merton means when he talks about neutrality or bias or what Polanyi does. But she says science is also sometimes represented as itself being a source of values and perhaps indeed the only true source of them. And she talks about the claim that science is omnicompetent, okay, that there's no domain in which it doesn't have mastery, that it can answer any kind of question, and therefore questions of value as well. Okay? So implicit already in how she's framing this is the idea that she thinks that science has a sphere of validity and that problems arise when it extends outside that sphere. And it's not entirely dissimilar to the sorts of things that Habermas was talking about week two reading, if any of you took a look at that piece, he has a different solution to it, but it's in that same sort of space, the worry that science can assert its expertise over morality when that may not actually be where its expertise lies. And then she talks about a heroic self-understanding of science, this thing that comes out and immediately has a sort of an eagle eye for expressions of a particular kind of imagery that imply that scientists are doing something especially virile, especially masculine, especially dominant, uh, and, uh, and really heroic while they're sitting away in their labs. Um, so she says, we do indeed sometimes think of science just as an immense store cupboard of objective facts, unquestionable data about such things as measurements, temperatures, and chemical composition. But a store cupboard is not in itself very exciting. I guess it's not very sexy. It's not very interesting uh, to think of what you're doing as a scientist as just assembling these sort of things and tucking them away and classifying them correctly. She says, what makes science into something much grander and more interesting than this is the huge, ever-changing, imaginative structure of ideas by which scientists strive to connect, understand, and interpret these facts. The general concepts, metaphors, and images that make up this structure cannot possibly be objective and antiseptic in this same way. They grow out of images drawn from everyday experience because that's the only place to get them. And after they've been used in science, they are often reflected back into everyday life in altered forms, seemingly charged with a new scientific authority. And she has in mind phenomena like what are discussed by Stuart Hall or McClintock, for those of you who did those readings in earlier weeks, this idea that you can have popular conceptions, even popular prejudices. The scientists as people who also participate in this popular world pick up these prejudices and biases and uh, narrative frameworks like everybody else, they carry them over into their interpretive work in science. That's not necessarily harmful, but then sometimes these interpretive frameworks that come out of popular, popular culture to begin with get reflected back onto popular culture as though they've emerged out of science. And at that point, particular collections of popular values and prejudices come to look like they have a scientific authority. And in the background of this, she'll have in mind 
things like eugenics, things like Stalinist Marxism that presents itself as a scientific achievement. Okay, so she's worried about things that use the mantle of science and its purported objectivity to sort of dress up the worst sorts of popular prejudices and to give them a rationalization that they might not otherwise be able to find. And again, she highlights several common metaphors, the machine metaphor, the notion of a self-interested individual, the notion of competition amongst individuals. And she says, metaphorical concepts like these are quite properly used by scientists, but they're not just passive pieces of apparatus like thermostats. So the data itself, by itself, doesn't give you a notion of competition amongst individuals or self-interest or machinery. That's not coming from there, it's coming from us. They have their own influence. The metaphors we choose to help us make sense of the data we're getting, to drive us to seek out particular kinds of data, has an influence. It's not passive. It's not just decorative. Such ideas are not just a distraction from real thought, as positivists have suggested, nor are they a disease. She uses this a few times in this chapter. She's thinking about the notion of a meme, and part of her quarrel with Dawkins is over this. Okay, so she doesn't think that cultural artifacts can be conceptualized along the metaphor of a meme with which you get infected. Uh, she thinks that this is intrinsic to how we think. They are the matrix of thought, the background that shapes our mental habits. They decide what we think important and what we ignore. They provide the tools with which we organize the mass of incoming data. When they are bad, they can do a great deal of harm by distorting our selection and slanting our thinking. That is why we need to watch them so carefully. Okay, so again, she's got in mind these historical phenomena, this phenomena like eugenics, phenomena like the sort of use of the mantle of science uh, to push quite horrific social policies and social projects. And she's suggesting that these metaphors, when unexamined, are part of what enables that kind of misuse of science to take place. And then she says, look, we're in a rapidly changing society, but there's no reason to assume that our myths, that our structures of thought, that our interpretive frameworks change anywhere nearly as quickly as our circumstances do. And this can cause a problem because we can be in quite new circumstances where our actions can have quite different effects, and yet we're still thinking in old ways, and this can be harmful. She says, we have a belief in kind of the ability to change our ideas instantly, and she thinks that's a myth itself. She talks about it a little bit in relation to Descartes and Nietzsche. She says, the trouble about this is that such large-scale items don't suddenly vanish. Prominent ideas cannot die until the problems that arise within them have been resolved. And this is itself an interesting and probably contentious claim that she's just made. They are organic parts of our lives, cognitive and emotional habits, structures that shape our thinking. The Marxist pattern of complete final revolution is not at all appropriate here. We do better to talk organically of our thought as an ecosystem, trying painfully to adapt itself to changes in the world around it. Okay? She's proposing an alternative set of metaphors, so it's not as though she stepped into a metaphor-free space herself. She prefers the metaphor of an ecosystem, and in some of her other works, she'll talk about things like the Gaia Hypothesis. And then she runs through a set of enlightenment concepts and says we need to engage with these concepts critically and that's where this book's going to start. She says they need our attention because they tend to be particularly simple and sweeping. And she talks about how an enlightenment ideal like freedom potentially conflicts with ideals that we also hold to be important, like justice or compassion. And then she gives some examples of this that can be slightly tendentious uh, depending on where you are. Uh, but she talks about the damage that can be done by totally free competition or the damage that can be done by total freedom to carry weapons. She says we need then to supplement the original daz dazzling insight about freedom with a more discriminative priority system. We need some way to make judgments between our conflicting ideals. She talks about the ideal of individuality and says, look, this has been very empowering, but she says if we don't watch it critically, it can lead to the kind of mindless competitiveness that is so destructive today. It impoverishes lives by locking people up in meaningless solitude. Again, it's a very controversial kind of statement. There are lots of people who would disagree with it. But she's using it as an example of the need to critically reflect 
on ideals and how absolute those ideals are. We've got multiple ideals. They don't all conform. They don't all lead to the same outcomes. At some point, we have to be able to make a choice between them. How well do our existing metaphors help us to come to those decisions? And the ideal of simplicity, the idea that you're going to try to come up with a, a neat mathematical equation, something that's going to give you a general law that will explain a phenomenon that looks complicated on the surface but is governed by an underlying simplicity. And she thinks that we have evidence now that this is not as extensible, that it's not something that we can carry over as far as the Enlightenment thinkers would have expected. They probably expected to be able to come up with laws like this for social life but we've not been able to cleanly do that. She says, of course this simplification played a great part in making possible the astonishing success of the physical sciences. It gave Western civilization an underlying understanding of natural mechanisms far beyond that of any culture. And it is right to celebrate this tremendous achievement that we, the heirs of this great intellectual empire, don't actually need to come together simply to praise it. This is a little similar to Foucault's argument in week two about what he calls the blackmail of enlightenment, where he says you're often offered the choice that you can sort of solely praise it, the enlightenment, and then you get to be counted as being among the rational. Or once you start criticizing something, you get lumped with the irrationalists. Foucault says that he rejects that opposition. Midgley saying something similar here. The fact that you appreciate the achievements of the enlightenment and of the values that flow out of it doesn't mean you can't try to criticize those same ideals and figure out in particular how our institutionalization of those ideals could be improved. So she says, science like freedom and democracy is well established as an ideal. This is the kind of criticism that really drives opponents of this kind of theory nuts. Okay, so there are a lot of theorists who will, in fact, be very worried, and we'll take a look at some of those next week and at various points of the course, that it is not at all safe to say that science, freedom, or democracy is well established as an ideal. These ideals are, in fact, still contested. There are still fights going on about them. It is not safe to regard them as established and secure, and so there's no harm done when you start criticizing them. So there's a body of people that will think that this form of theory attributes an unsupportable level of stability. They think that science, freedom, democracy can't be contested. And they'd be arguing something by analogy to something like what's happened with the welfare state, where you get critiques of it emerging in the 60s and 70s, where many of the critiques were assuming that, of course, the welfare state was going to stay around as an institution. Of course, it was safe. But it had flaws. And so we need to start picking those flaws apart. And yet, that line of criticism coincided with a set of criticism that was, in fact, going to roll back the structure itself, going to sort of change its institutionalization. So there are fears, and we'll take a look at some of those next week, that people like this who are making these criticisms are assuming the object of criticism is basically safe, is basically strong. And so you don't actually have to worry about lending support to its enemies. Okay? Mitchell doesn't agree with that. She thinks it is an established ideal. And as an established ideal, we need to criticize it. Uh, in order to make sure that it is not itself causing more harm than good. So she says, we need to examine the institutions that are designed to express this ideal. She says, today, some people plainly do not think that science is altogether good. At times, there are similar doubts about democracy and freedom. In such cases, those of us who care about the ideals need to ask what's going wrong with the way in which they're being incorporated into the world. We have to consider how best to understand the present condition of science, how best to live with its difficulties and responsibilities, and how to shape its further development so as to avoid these distortions. So she's aware that there's criticism going on. She thinks that criticism probably indicates there's something wrong. We need to work out what it is and see if there's some kind of critical improvement possible. Other people will say, wait a minute, there's criticism going on. The ideals themselves are in question and in danger, and this kind of critique doesn't help. Okay, and the science wars crystallizes around that distinction. She says, purportedly scientific ideologies, Marxism and behaviorism, have damaged the image of science, and claims to omnicompetence damage science too. She says, lovers of physical science can be happy to see it as it is, as one great department of human thought among others, 
which all cooperate in our efforts at understanding the world. Okay, so again, she's got metaphors of her own in play. It's a department. When we think department, we immediately think, well, there's multiple departments. Okay, so this slots into one of those. They each have their own domain. It's a department of a university or a department of a business. Um, so she's tossing out some of her own metaphors, some of her own myths that she wants to use in place of the myth of omnicompetence. This is a far more honorable status, she says, than that of a 19th century political power trying to enlarge its empire by universal conquest. Okay, so the implication here is that the universalism of science, as we've talked about in various weeks of this course, historically coincides with a period of imperial expansion, and its universalism reflects to some degree the universal political aspirations of imperial powers. And she's suggesting, without sort of saying it overtly at this point in the book, that our notion of science has been infected by these sort of political realities, and that we can disentangle that particular image, that particular political drive from our sense of what science is meant to do, we can use a more mundane set of myths and metaphors. It's a department, okay, and it can coexist alongside many others.